Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Manufacturing Leaders Roundtable webinar. I'm Steve O'Brien. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Shiftboard, and I will be the moderator today. Um, today, we've got a great group of panelists, and the uh, topic of the day is how to attract and retain talent um, in these very challenging times. Uh, this is the kickoff of a new webinar series that we're starting uh, directed to manufacturing uh, customers and, and and clients to address and talk about things that are challenging them um, in today's times. So with that, I would like to uh, make introductions and uh, to kick things off, I'm going to have each one of our panelists introduce themselves and share a little bit about their backgrounds. Uh, we've got an incredible group of panelists today, and I think you'll uh, see that very evidently as we go through introductions. So I'm going to start off with Libby, uh, Libby Andrews Simmons. Uh, would you please uh, give the audience a little bit of background on yourself? Yes, thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate the opportunity to share with the panelists and with Shiftboard and, and all who have interest in this topic today. I am Libby Andrews Simmons. I'm the HR manager at Enios Chocolate Bayou facility. Um, we are located near Houston, Texas, about 30 miles south of Houston, Texas. Um, Enios is the third largest petrochemical company in the world. Um, our site here at Chocolate Bayou, we have about 600 employees. We uh, manufacture olefins and polymers for uh, as a commodity chemical for distribution um, in various locations. And we, as I've mentioned, have about 600 employees here. And again, excited to be here and share with you. Great, Libby. Thanks very much. Uh, Wes? Hi, everybody, and uh, excited to be here with you all today. Uh, I'm Wes Waringen, Senior Vice President of Operations at Medline Industries. Uh, Medline is the one of the largest uh, manufacturers, distributors of healthcare products uh, in the world. Uh, I'm primarily responsible for 48 distribution centers, about 10,000 team members, uh, and uh, excited to talk about uh, labor staffing with you all. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Wes. Uh, Ru, Ru Patel. Uh, hey, Steve. Thank you so much for this. Uh, I'm Ru Patel. I'm a retired General Mills guy, so I spent 30 years at General Mills in their manufacturing facilities for the most part. A little bit of R&D time, but my last uh, major role with General Mills was leading their Cedar Rapids facility, which is one of their largest facilities worldwide and uh, in all aspects of manufacturing. So since retirement, I've started a consulting job because that's what all manufacturing retirees kind of do. Uh, and I do a bunch of executive coaching, and I'm helping small businesses restructure and scale up so they can actually grow up and be bigger businesses. So failing retirement with a smile on my face, and I appreciate the opportunity to work with you. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Rue. Rue will be able to add a lot of perspective from a variety of different companies that he's worked with, which is great. Uh, and last but not least, I'd like to introduce Peter Draper, um, who yeah, works at Shipboard. Peter, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Steve. Um, yes, I'm the VP of Customer Success at, at Shipboard. So myself and my team are tasked with uh, onboarding and supporting shiftboard customers using our labor staffing and scheduling solutions. We partner with those customers to ensure they get the maximum value uh, out of those products. Uh, personally, I've, I've spent about 25 years delivering and supporting enterprise workforce management solutions. Uh, a lot of that with uh, manufacturing and energy clients and with a specific focus on scheduling solutions, time, and attendance solutions. And uh, despite my my accent, I'm actually based in uh, in Seattle in the shift board offices there. Uh, thank you, Peter. We've got people, uh, and Rue and Wes, you're in the Midwest, and Libby, you're you're down in in the south part of Texas, right? Um, so we've got people calling in from all over all over the area. So this is great. So just a quick note to our audience: um, if you've got any questions for the panelists as we go, just feel free to uh, put those into chat and then post the webinar. We will uh, get back to you on any um, on those on those questions with answers from our panelists. That's how we'll how we'll handle that. So with that, let's turn to let's get things kicked off and and start the questions. All right. So uh, our first question is, is: What are the challenges manufacturers are facing today in attracting and retaining workers? And Rue, why don't you kick us off? 
Steve, thank you. So when you speak about attracting and retaining workers in today's day, that is the single biggest challenge that industry faces today. And the second one after that would be finding the right materials at the right time so they can actually fulfill orders. But labor is by and far the biggest issue. And really what's not a challenge about this, right? So, I mean, you start with a year and a half ago with uh, us dealing with the COVID pandemic and the stress that creates in the workforce in terms of places shutting down, trying to start up, creating safe places for people to work, uh, masking in the job. Uh, masking with goggles in their job. So, I mean, this is this has become very complicated and quite frankly, that, that created a lot of stress for all workers and managers uh, in America. So you can compound that with decisions now around to vax or not to vax. And what does that mean for me in my workplace? Does my employer require me to do it? Does it uh, Is it mandatory? Do I have my job at risk if I choose not to? Uh, if I'm vaxxed or not vaxxed, do I deal with my coworkers in a different way? Again, more stress. And then you compound that with you know, work habits of people have changed. The generations are definitely diff are different. People are more interested in time off and they're interested in flexibility and they're interested in a better culture and a place to work, which I'm sure we'll cover later. Mm-hmm. But a tag with that, you know, government subsidies don't, don't are not helping people come back into work. At some point, we will have to entertain people back into the workforce because that is their primary source of income, which will be different for a lot of people. And it's a competitive market. For workers, Steve. So, I mean, you've seen things like sign-on bonuses, retention bonuses, retention bonuses that are months instead of years. That's different. Wages being paid differently, increased wages. Uh, I talked to a company a week ago, and, and since the pandemic, they've had three different wage increases. So, obviously, this, these are margin decretive, or the cost gets passed on to the consumer where it's tolerable. And I've even seen people where they pay people on a daily basis. So, imagine handing a paycheck out on a daily basis to keep people coming back the next day, right? And so people are trying every measure if they could to keep people and retain them. Um, but a fact that goes un, unspoken is if you think back 18 to 20 years ago, and I'm old enough to think back that way, we, we were in the recession. And in every recession, you have uh, fewer kids being born in that recession. So 20 years later, you have fewer high school kids and 20 year olds entering the job market. And for the most part, those folks aren't going to trade schools and et cetera. So it's a smaller population base to hire from. And uh, at the same time, the boomers, guys like me, are retiring. So we're creating this gap of just a base number of people available, leave alone the skills and talents required for them to be you know, successful. So those people want flexibility. They want balance in their lives. They want an easier place to work. They want a softer culture, if you will. It's harder to do all those things with what I talked about around, hey, we're going to be short staff, so you might have to work over, right? That's stressful. We may not be able to get materials, and so we're waiting or we're changing systems over more frequently, so it's harder to kind of work in a given environment. So there's just a ton of stuff going on. And you know, if you go to retention, you know, I think culture speaks loudly. The type of work you do and the type of workplace you have and the culture you create around the quality workforce, the hours, the schedule time off, flexibility, do people listen to me? Am I getting recognized at work for things I do? Am I engaged in the workplace beyond you know, stamping a die or clocking in, clocking out? And it comes down to a lot of cases, you know, the development of supervisors, the immediate supervisor to deal with on a day in, day out, several times a day basis. It really impacts people's ability to come to work, stay to work, stay engaged, and be part of this workforce. So maybe a long-winded answer to what you're asking, Steve, but there's several things that kind of go in, and it's almost like a perfect storm that we're in right now. Yeah, that's a good way to sum it up, and a lot a lot to unpack there. Um, uh, Wes, Liddy, any any thoughts on, on Rue's opening statements there? So I, I believe Rue has really hit on many of the, I think if we look just across uh, our country, all of those challenges are real, especially for manufacturing where uh, people need to be physically present in order to uh, complete their jobs. We haven't had the flexibility in manufacturing of people being able to, to pick up and readily be able to go and work from home when you're running uh, equipment, when your uh, your <laughs> your product is, is dependent on actually having people physically at work, it is a bit of a challenge. And I think the one thing um, from my perspective that Ru talked about is it's really been the stress I mean, we, we, we have good people in place. Uh, however, uh, everybody, I think, uh, you know, just for, for one reason or another has had a lot of stress in the last year and a half, be it COVID, be it um, childcare, be it 
um, uh, rearranging family priorities, be it working from home or, or having to come to work or just going to the grocery store, right, has been a challenge in, in many situations. And so just dealing with that stress and understanding that people are being impacted in ways, first of all, none of us could have probably ever anticipated with the pandemic. And we're, we're just having to continue to run uh, our businesses um, um, along with all of those stressors. I, I, I agree, and, and Rue and Libby hit it on it again with, you know, it's just that long period of sustained stress. It's kind of a hurricane compared to a tornado. Tornado sweeps through, it does a lot of damage, but it, it moves on. Hurricane stays around much longer and is a sustained impacts. The beginning of the pandemic, everybody was celebrating frontline workers for going to work every day. Now, you know, that th those celebrations, you don't see those celebrations anymore. And still the frontline workers are going in day in, day out. And um, it's only gotten tougher. They're only asked to work more hours because there's fewer people in the in the workforce today. Uh, you know, something else we touched on is just that the, the shrinking, you know, 10 years ago, everybody noticed the shift in uh, the, the, the workforce demographics. You know, there's, I think even before COVID, millennials took over the majority of the workforce. Um, and the needs and wants are different than uh, prior generations. Not, not a bad thing. Um, and I, I don't want to, for any of my millennial friends, I don't want to, uh, I'm not talking ill. You have a lot to provide. You're generally better educated, uh, have you know better values, uh, and I think can bring a lot more to the table. But old dinosaurs like me and other people still, you know, making decisions or in leadership roles uh, think differently, and we have to give up those thoughts and and just agree that maybe a different perspective is better. Um, so that, I mean, for that, for me personally, that, that was a pivotal moment. Um, but uh, back to, to something that was just said, you know, a lot of people with COVID, or I, I would say COVID just accelerated things. Um, you had uh, a, an aging workforce that decided to, I'm getting out early, it's time. I, you know, I can't handle this stress or I don't want to deal with this stress or I'm concerned about my, my well-being. And you had the younger members of the workforce go back home, not because they just didn't want to work, but they had to care for their, for their parents. You know, somebody has to go to the grocery store for them. Uh, somebody has to, you know, run other errands for them or, or get them their medicine or whatever. And um, maybe they like the security of being at home. Uh, maybe they can still be covered under their, you know, the parents are supporting them, whatever. So that kind of burned the candle at both ends. And uh, I think it's why we're in the situation we're in now. So. Yeah, no, it's well, well stated the uh, analogy of the tornado and the hurricane. And certainly I think some of these, um, some of these issues are going to ultimately uh, fade a little bit, and some of these are are not, you know, um, to, to that point. Which uh, so a, a lot to unpack here. Peter, any any thoughts on your think, side before we jump in to dig in some of, digging into some of these? No, I think great points by everyone. You know what what I have heard in in addition to that from a number of our manufacturing clients is there's a bit of a segmentation into the problem as well. So a number of customers I've spoken with sort of look at the problem in sort of two parts. One part of the shortage is with the skilled um, positions, um, you know, key um, elements of the of the workforce who just it's really hard to hire them and get them, and it's hard to to keep them uh, just because of the competitive pressures that they're under. Versus perhaps you know the lower skilled positions where there's just a, a significant problem associated with attendance, right, and 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 callouts. So a number of people tend to sort of think about the problem in two ways. One is how I retain the key talent, right, and look in compensation and things like that. And then the other part of the problem is not so much how do I get extra labor into these lower skill positions, 
but how do I ensure they turn up? How do I ensure I have the coverage that I need if there are call outs in those positions? Yeah, just the op operational continuity aspect of yeah. all this. Yeah, good, good points. Uh, well, let's let's um, let's dig into this a little bit um, in terms of maybe starting off with some of the, the near term things that that organizations are doing today to just uh, address this. And you know, let's let's not necessarily be specific to COVID. We'll kind of come back to that one a little bit, um, or but just just at the elevation that kind of the, the three of you spoke at, you know, there's all these drivers uh, kind of all kind of arriving at the same time that are um, obviously kind of colliding and forcing, you know, a lot of pressure on organizations. So breaking this up into kind of short-term, long-term, um, let's first start talking about some of the short-term strategies that organizations are doing. Um, Wes, how about kicking us off on that one? Sure. Uh, I mean, Peter uh, touched on it with the the attendance, uh, whether you call it attendance or participation. I think one of the first things uh, steps to do is understand where where are you now. A deeper dive and a deeper understanding of your metrics around you know for, specifically for recruiting. Um, you know, what is your target headcount? You know, uh, how long is it taking to fill positions? Do we need to adjust our expectations, uh, our screening criteria? All of these things impact not only that applicant flow, but that retention. What, how many are you going to retain? If you loosen your restrictions, are you going to inadvertently, you know, increase turnover? Uh, the uh, I think it's important to recognize that you know some of these things are going to happen uh, maybe unconsciously. Leaders are going to maybe be a little easier on people, and maybe they should be. Uh, in, in the, under the current labor market. But I, I think more people need to be aware uh, that not all of this is going to be a conscious decision. There's going to be things that people unconsciously do to adjust. Uh, but uh, to that, you know, what is that target? What does that new target need to be to make up for that gap? Right? Aim high to hit, you know, aim a little bit higher to hit the, hit the mark. Uh, we talked a little bit about compensation. Uh, Aru mentioned the number of increases. I know, I certainly know what we've done. Uh, and uh, is that sustainable? You know, what impact is that going to have uh, next year when the economy maybe shifts in a different direction? Uh, you know, are the things that you can do temporarily? Um, the uh, is it all about money? With you know, my personal opinion is I don't think it is. I think it's it has more to do with flexibility. Uh, we talked, mentioned that earlier. You know, giving team members the opportunity to choose their hours, their workplace, the type of work they're doing, I think can be more important is sometimes more important than what they're actually making. Uh, and if uh, so, to that point you know how you know not just being more flexible in the resources that you're uh, you're leveraging uh, how can we be more flexible in you know, scheduling that work and and even creating that work uh, are there things that can be postponed are there conversations transparent conversations we can have with customers uh, and make some accommodations uh, or concessions together to to improve the the situation. Uh, you know, one positive thing about the current labor market is it's affecting everyone. So everyone is in the same boat, uh, up and down the supply chain. So uh, you know, don't be afraid to have it engage with uh, other people outside your business uh, about it and and see what you can do to uh, make positive improvements or reduce the workload non you know look at non-value add activity opportunities to consolidate activity uh, Wes just a follow-up question on the you know, on the point of uh, you know being able to or or the potential care to provide more flexibility to workers how mm -hmm. How do you see that being balanced with just the, the natural restraint of labor period, right? So you're you're already running short potentially on 
on your work, you know, workforce in terms of just your labor capacity. Um, and and a tool like greater flexibility is for, to our work schedule would be a huge, you know, attractor to keeping keeping workers happy. But but how do how can organizations kind of balance those two pressures? Um, Just so I'm clear on understanding the question, you're talking about balancing demand with the the, late, the pool of labor I have to work with. Correct. Yeah, correct. Well, I, I mean, I think you burn the candle at both ends. You, you know, I think everybody needs to be uh, working on ways to uh, identify uh, opportunities to balance their workload, uh, to shift workload, to shift. Um, or postpone activities that aren't is maybe time critical. Anything you can do to, you know, uh, beat down those peaks. Uh, also, though, I, I think, you know, historically, everyone, you know, staffs and, and does other things to an average, right, over time. And the problem with that average is there's going to be, a, you're often going to find yourself short of what you need. And that's when things aren't going to happen the way they're supposed to, or people, someone's going to take shortcuts, or people are going to be upset that they're working an extra hours. And when you're at the bottom of that um, roller coaster, you're going to have a whole bunch of other issues, and not to mention, you know, surplus labor, poor utilization, whatever. Uh, so I think changing or shifting, um, you know, changing the paradigm and, and finding a way to uh, staff to that lowest common denominator. Uh, and, you know, that's where your fixed regular, you know, uh, labor lives and then be more agile in staffing or covering the, the, the volatile, the volatility of the peaks uh, is, you know, that's the future, I think, of uh, labor staffing. And, and to do that, there's, you know, Fortunately, there's, there's quite a few options. Yep. Great. All right. Um, other panelists around the just just short term actions you see being taken out there? Yeah, I'll weigh in for a little bit of this. Um, and what I've seen is that companies that have chosen to invest in automation have made some significant strides. So I'm working with the manufacturer that made this decision five years ago, and they've implemented simple robotics to do think, simple tasks like stack collate, et cetera. And it's really been a time where now they're not proof, they're not isolated from the labor issues, but they're buffered from them more so than their competitive status. And they've got a better chance to kind of make it through it. If you think about it, there isn't a better time, you know, in, in manufacturing than right now for a workforce to accept automation, uh, where in the past it would typically be a fight because it would be job replacement. Now it's job enhancement because I'm not working so many overtime shifts or I'm not getting forced for this or that because I've got this robot buddy next to me that's helping me do some of my the menial tasks. So, uh, and some of those automation solutions aren't super expensive. Uh, and you can see as you start paying people more and more by the hour, uh, the ROIs get easier to hit uh, when you can do some of those things. Yeah, good points. Yeah, great point. Uh, you know, Wes had, had commented a lot right on the demand side of the equation, right? If you can't affect the supply side as much as you would like in terms of the available labor, make sure you're being efficient with the, the labor that you have. And uh, again, I, I, I hear a lot from um, our manufacturing production line customers in particular on this, right? Which is the value and the impact of a single employee now is potentially much greater. We, we hear stories of, you know, on occasion people have to shut down a production line because the one employee with the one set of skills right is is not available so actions that you can take to sort of figure out your the demand for the labor and spread that out and Wes had sort of touched on some of these items is going to give you much greater dividends than maybe it did before given yeah. the, the supply constraints we have like cross training and some of some of those role cross training yeah good, good, right. great great yeah. point great point um, all right, well, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about kind of the same issue, you know, which is just uh, strategies companies are, are doing. But let's shift from kind of shorter term, near term things to just maybe the, the, the long picture. 
um, you know, ass assuming this this labor shortage isn't going to be going away tomorrow or the next month, um, um, what what can organizations you know uh, think about for the medium term or the longer term that might, might be things to be getting on their uh, objectives and priorities right now? Libby, why so, don't yeah, go ahead, Libby. Okay, thank you. So um, one of the things I think is it's very important and uh, you know just pays those long term dividends is are we investing in our first level leaders? So primarily those individuals who supervise um, your 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 key workers, uh, typically your hourly employees. Um, one of the things we always want to be mindful of is the number one reason people leave companies is because they don't like their boss. And so if uh, we have our uh, first level, front level supervisors there and we don't have them equipped, not just to supervise because typically uh, people uh, get promoted because of their technical skills, but they also have to have a, some, some leadership skills. They need to be able to coach. They need to be able to provide good feedback. They need to uh, be able to um, allow individuals to have input uh, into the work that they're doing. They, they need to be able to provide good recognition for uh, a job well done. They need to be able to discipline employees in a way that doesn't erode relationships. And so all of those are skills that long-term pay really high dividends, uh, literally, uh, and, and through productivity uh, companies that are investing in their first level leaders are going to see uh, 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 a better safety outcome, which is always going to be important in manufacturing, but but the productivity and engagement comes from making sure those um, uh, those supervisors can lead people. Um, and you know, beyond that, I think uh, having a strong communication plan where you're getting all levels of leadership out in front of employees, where employees know what's going on, where they have a sense of connectivity to the organization, is is important as well. Um, and, it, and as much as you can increase that face-to-face -face communication. And I think just lastly, as far as long-term strategies, um, employees want to see companies out in their community. Um, you know, uh, being a good community steward, that's really a license to operate for an organization, particularly a manufacturing organization. People want to see things not just going out for sale, but they want to see things coming out that help benefit the individuals who live um, and, and work near where, where we're located. And so, uh, you know, and it's not just money. They, uh, of course, they want to see scholarships. They want to see us uh, give uh, money back to community uh, charities and efforts, but they also want to see things like mentoring. They want to see us promoting uh, STEM learning, uh, particularly for diverse groups of individuals and bringing people in that have never had the opportunity to work um, in this environment before. We want to see uh, kids being developed to be, to be engineers, to be managers, um, and also to have other skills because we can use skills at all levels of the organization. Uh, and that's even something particularly uh, for development that we may have missed over, you know, as as an industry is is making sure that that people understand there are good paying jobs in manufacturing that don't necessarily require a four year degree. You can get a two year degree and and go to work and make some really good money and have a a, a, st a sense of stability and, and and raise a family on that. Um, and and then are are we measuring an engagement? Or do we have a good idea of how rooted employees are? Um, do, do they have a sense of ownership in, in, in their um, organization? Um, and do they have a sense of connectivity to the leadership to all, all again, all levels of the organization? And so um, back to our hurricane model, all of those things take a lot of time um, and you can't do it once you get caught in the storm. And so that's the, as, as we've talked about, that's this, these are not short term mm -hmm. objectives. It takes a long time. It takes about five years just to effect a true cultural change in an organization. So obviously the sooner we get started, uh, the, the sooner we'll start to see those results. Yeah, great points. And uh, kind of along the themes that uh, Rue mentioned that, you know, sounds like you see this as really an opportunity, you know, for, for, for organizations to do some things they necessarily haven't had the, the time or focus to be able to go do. So we're, we're great, great points. Other, other perspective, other follow-up to what Olivia introduced. Well, I certainly, I, the, something Libby started off with 
uh, you know, talking about the frontline supervisors, just uh, every, one of the best articles I've ever read. It's a 1980s Harvard Business Review article about let first level supervisors do their job. Um, you know, talks about individuals who, in all likelihood, just yesterday were hourly team members, right, and, and not in a leadership role. And they're thrust into this new, you know, new role as a frontline supervisor, uh, expected to represent uh, the organization uh, in in a different way, be a leader, uh, make difficult decisions, and probably haven't had all the training and development that they need. So I think just keeping that in perspective and remembering that uh, they're not, you know, that far removed from being an individual contributor contributor so it's going to take some time and a lot of uh, uh, mentoring and attention to, to get them to where they they need to be and and be especially cautious for those that are working the off shifts that don't that have even less support and and have become self-sufficient so um, Wes, that's a great point. I, I actually get asked that quite a bit with clients that I go work with. Uh, so I think people are maybe starting to recognize some of that uh, because the best uh, electrician does not make the best supervisor in, in most cases, right? So uh, we hire people, move, advance them for the wrong reasons as opposed to give them an opportunity to do what they really do well. But I've had several requests for people to say, can you put together a supervisory development plan based on you know the architecture we have in our in our company and where our folks have come from. Um, and I get that more and more. So to your point, Wes, I think people are figuring that out. And that is goes back to exactly what Libby said is, you know, people leave uh, poor leaders. Uh, you know, I think in today's day, they also leave uh, poor jobs. Uh, but by and large, if your leader uh, is a good leader, they can make up for some of those job strains and stresses by just providing great leadership like Libby talked about. Uh, just to emphasize one point though, I, I think there's a lot of great plans for you know, development plans and information available, you know, uh, any number of places. But to have somebody that's there with that new supervisor on the hours they work, providing that support, I think is is missing from a lot of, um, you know, training and development programs that organizations have. Well, and what Wes, you, you hit it on the head. One of our development programs actually included some on-site coaching um, with with the consultant where um, our supervisors could come and actually talk about one-on-one -on -one with a coach around, okay, here's some of the things I'm dealing with and, and get that individual uh, coaching. So uh, when organizations have that opportunity to do it, it's, it's definitely worth uh, taking the time and investment to do it. Great. Well, let, let's switch gears a little bit. And just because, uh, you know, COVID obviously came up in, in the opening salvo of, of just the first question about some of the challenges. So let's let's talk about COVID specific challenges um, and and what companies are, are needing to do with all the mandates and so forth out there. So, you know, Peter, you you interact with a lot of customers on, on our behalf. So uh, maybe let you kick that We'll let you kick that one off. Sure. No, thanks, Steve. So, you know, the, the impact of COVID is obviously hard to avoid in almost any conversation, particularly staffing. And, uh, you know, our, our sort of short term period of COVID is, is now 18 months and counting. And I think we all know that it's probably going to continue for a little while longer. Uh, and I think we're still seeing some of those initial impacts today while, whilst the, the level or acuteness of some of the fallout is is obviously less today than it was a year ago with the vaccine rollout. I, I think that the patterns that we're seeing in manufacturing and energy and the impact on the labor market is really very similar to what we were seeing 15 months and 18 months ago in terms of the level of disruption and the level of uncertainty that it that it causes. And I'm I'm hearing from our customers they're seeing that in in really three areas. They're seeing it number one in skewed and unstable demand patterns. So the demand for individual companies' products and services is, you know, flip-flopping is a little extreme, but it definitely sort of skewed high, be it, you know, for masks and PPE early in, in the pandemic. Uh, but we're, we're also seeing less stability, right, in those demand plan, 
a pattern. So they're having to respond much more quickly to greater shifts in some sectors of the economy. Second area is supply chain disruptions. And in a sense, we're seeing more of that now even than we did a year ago. So, you know, I talked about people getting production lines stopping earlier because of one worker. Well, you can also have production lines stop because a critical ingredient to what you're making didn't come in as planned. And I'm hearing that a lot. And then, of course, the third area we, we touched on earlier, which is the, the employee attendance problems and the disruptions that those cause. So that's the, the how COVID is impacting us. And obviously, it drives a strategy for talent recruiting that needs to, number one, respond quickly to rapid demand shifts. Number two, handle short notice production schedule changes for those um, demand pattern shifts, right? And work call outs impacting it as well. So it's challenging. In terms of what organizations are doing about it, very much depends on their own situation. But there are some common themes I'm, I'm hearing. Uh, definitely maximizing the amount of remote work and flexibility, which Wes mentioned, is, is key wherever you can do it. You can't do it, obviously, in, in all cases. But that will both help your employees out and it will mitigate your COVID risk if you just have less, less overlap, right? So that's, that's number one, and that's sort of universal. I think building some resilience into your production schedules so that if you have those last minute changes from supply disruptions, you kind of know what your contingency solution or SKU or product that you can go to is if you can't make the primary SKU that you want to make. So I'm, I'm hearing about those strategies sort of starting to develop more so than we had before when you had greater reliability. And then the last area we sort of touched on earlier in one of the earlier questions, which is you've got some key employees with some key skills, which means you've got a single point reliance if those employees get called out or something happens. So anything you can do in terms of cross training or perhaps moving some of those functions, some of those employees perform today to uh, part time or temp employees to free them up more fully to focus on the core functions. I'm hearing a number of those strategies as well. Well, I think too, Peter, understanding what everyone's capabilities or competencies are, because you may, you may not even be aware that you have an opportunity to shift this individual to another area or consolidate activities mm -hmm. uh, to uh, you know, this group of individuals who are qualified to do that work. That's absolutely right. I had a couple of conversations with people who'd sort of done that deep dive into what people did. And it was sort of two part, right? One was, I had no idea they were involved in all these mundane functions, which frankly, I could move to someone else. And number two, I didn't know they could do this as well. So that inspection really helped. Are, are there thoughts on, on COVID specific situation I, you see in organizations? Yeah, I, I mean, I, Kind of look at the positive and things, and and one thing about COVID is I think it, it greatly accelerated, um, you know, people's ability to adapt to new technology, new processes, new you know changes. I mean, look at Zoom. You know, um, <laughs> how often are we having meetings now remotely? You know, via Zoom or or you know, um, go to meeting or whatever. And and you know, ten years ago or even Three years ago, uh, it was a, a mere fraction. I think people have uh, a willingness to take to take those leaps when things are more chaotic than than when they are calm. Um, you know, you know. I don't know why I'm stuck on disasters, but in a, in a, <laughs> when when all heck is breaking that you know breaking loose, no one has any problem buying inventory, give it to me. What cost? I don't care. Just as long as you can get it, get it to me. What am I carrying? I, it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of how much I can produce. You get outside of a disaster situation. I mean, look at it pre-COVID. You know, organizations, uh, manufacturer, distribution, retail, anything, uh, had gotten their inventories as low as they've ever been. Their labor as efficient as it had ever been. 
Uh, all those things, though, it's like the you know you just remove the shock the shocks from your car, and here comes the speed bump, and we just all hit our heads uh, on the on the roof of the car because nobody had any of that resilience left in their in their supply chain, and so now it's about figuring out you know where can I build put that resilience back in, or is there a different way other than just a whole bunch of inventory or surplus labor? Uh, that I can, uh, there are other resources I can leverage to still have that same protection. You know, Steve, you, your, part of your question was around short-term recruiting and talent acquisition. So I'm not sure we got to the recruiting part, but recruiting has changed in the last year as well. And you can't have the big trade fairs, career fairs, open houses. Uh, you can't have the on-the-job previews. Uh, type of stuff. So finding ways to do those virtually, finding ways to do those remote really has become a critical part of how we do that. And the question always becomes is when when you can't physically be in the same room and assess things like body language and stuff, it's just harder to recruit the right talent. And I'm not just talking about the wage levels, I'm talking about all levels of the organization. When you're doing this virtually, the risk of finding a bad hire increases. And obviously, as we know, when you have a bad hire, uh, it can be damaging and the risk of what they do to, to you and but by the time you fix it or get it out is even greater now than it's ever been before. So combine that with the competitive space we are for talent, that becomes really challenging. So you know, HR teams that I'm kind of seeing are helping people and creating specialties on how do you recruit online and what things do you look for and how do you look at a resume with even more scrutiny than you did before and learn what questions to ask legally. Uh, that will that will vet out the things three or four characteristics that we're looking for. It's it's just so much different for me able to go walk, shake hands with somebody, and sit across the table from them, or grab lunch with someone and, and doing you know the assessment that we're kind of used to. But times are changing, and uh, the client base is changing, and so we have to adapt to those things as well. Are, are there any interesting new sources of labor supply that uh, anyone has kind of heard about or tried to tap? Uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, you know, temp agencies out there that uh, you know, maybe were used a, a little bit before. Are you using them more now, or are you just just in terms of you know strategies to expand your workforce capacity? Just interested th on thoughts on that. Oh, I was going to wait and hopefully hear some new ones that I haven't <laughs> tapped into yet. I, yeah. I mean, I I've, I've got my pen and paper. <laughs> uh, I think you have to use everything that's available. I mean, if whether it be a gig, um, you know, vocational improvement programs, I mean, we're finding, you know, ways to, you know, extend our use of um, vocational improvement programs just because, I, you know, I think we need to push some boundaries. Um, uh, ten, I, you know, I think I said part time, full time people. I mean, if somebody's interested in work, uh, I'll find a way to put them to work. Um, I mean, we're all at that point right now, right? So uh, that obviously adds a lot of complexity, and I think we have to be sophisticated in uh, how we approach this, you know, the diversity of sources. Um, you can't make it too difficult for the frontline leaders. We talked about supervisors not having a lot of experience doing this when they first get thrown into the job. So how do we make it easy for them to see what's available and, um, you know, task or, or you know, uh, assign that work? You know, Libby talked about uh, working with our community colleges and providing things like scholarships and stuff, right? So those things open the door to a lot of opportunities in those colleges. So, I mean, cash always is king. But if you're providing a scholarship, can you get to a class and, and teach? So can, you know, classes are back in session now live, right? So you may be masked, but you can see people behave, with, see what their behaviors are. You can talk to professors and maybe get access to sharing what your company does as you present a scholarship and give some visibility to who you are uh, that they may not get. The other piece is, you know, two years ago, there might have been two or three online platforms for recruiting, and now there's hundreds. And so you have to be where your client base is going to look. And, uh, you know, whether it's Indeed or something else, that you have to do a lot of those as opposed to just one or two of them um, and I, find different ways to get at people. 
Yeah, and Rue, I'm not I'm not arguing against your point, but it's something I, I was going to kick to Libby because I I'm not sure we can rely on everything online for the the type you know types of individuals who are coming in to work in a manufacturing environment or right. a warehouse environment. They they're used to face to face, right? And they're going to get they may get frustrated with an online interview. I I don't know you. I don't can see you. You know, I, whether it's a trust thing or a, um, they just want that direct interaction. I think we have to, we, you know, especially with COVID, have to find ways, you know, still protecting uh, our team members and the individuals who might be interested in coming to work for us. But um, I don't know, I, at least, you know, I've, I've seen uh, mixed uh, results with, you know, I, I should say, and or a large organization that's trying to keep as much work remote as possible, you know, clashing with uh, distribution and manufacturing, which is very much hands-on yes. and requires labor that is, you know, having to show up to touch things. And uh, I don't know, Libby, if you had, no, I, I absolutely, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you, Wes. It's very difficult, even in person, to get a really good sense from individuals as you're interviewing. And, and uh, to that end, I think probably most employers uh, would prefer to defer hiring uh, rather than having to go that route in terms of the, you know, the the virtual um, hiring processes. Uh, but uh, I understandably so. Sometimes that just can't be avoided. Um, and, 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 and it certainly wouldn't be my preference for, for an interview. Um, I guess the one thing um, that hasn't been talked about that I just wanted to add around COVID is it's really tested for uh, hands-on manufacturing how, in, uh, how uh, engaged our employees are because you think about with uh, COVID protocols, we, you know, we've had to ask employees to wear masks, we've had to ask them to social distance, we've had to ask them, you know, to wash their hands, and none of these things can, can be done without the cooperation of the employees. So this is probably tested how engaged our employees are, how how important is it to them to see their company do well and, and, and to make sure that they're contributing to the success of the company under some very challenging circumstances. And so, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I would just advise for, for, for any employer, regardless of the industry, is that if, if you don't have some measure of how rooted or engaged employees are, you probably understand it. I mean, I think there was, I, I don't want to call a particular fast food restaurant out, but there was, I think, one where all the employees just quit and put, a, a, put something on their mar marquee that we're closed because we don't work here anymore, and they just left. Um, and obviously, you don't want to see that happen, especially when you're trying to run a process uh, <laughs> unit. Um, but again, in, in these times, we really, you know, if you didn't already know how engaged your employees are, how connected they are to the organization, do they trust their leadership? Do they believe we are, are going to look out for their best interest? If you don't have a sense of that, you probably have a sense of it now post-COVID and, and again, having to ask people to do things not only while they're working, because you think about, we had to, you know, as employers, we had to ask employees to think about what you're doing on your off time about, you know, are you going to the grocery store? Are you going to uh, family events? Are you going to public events that are going to potentially put your health at risk and bring that back to the workplace? And we really had to have already uh, you know, as employers, a, a, a good trust and bond with employees to hope that they would do the right things when we needed them to do the right things. Yeah, great, great, great point. In fact, I think that is a, a great way to maybe transition a little bit. We were talking a lot about kind of the operational challenges and strategies that organizations are doing from an operational side. Let's switch gears and talk about it from the worker perspective. Um, and, you know, maybe a question and it kind of leads into to a lot of the stuff that was talked about early on, which was, you know, you have, you have COVID, you've got generational, um, you know, people, a lot of people retiring, less workers coming in the workforce, right? All these, all these various drivers that are, that are kind of now front and center. So uh, maybe just a, a, a kind of a big picture question, you know, are we at an inflection point 
today with what workers expect, right? And what are their expectations? Um, and you know, Libby, uh, maybe let's start with you on that one. Okay. Um, so I think as far as uh, the, the expectations of employees, um, obviously uh, in manufacturing, are we keeping our, our employees safe? That would, that would you know, be uh, one of the first concerns. Um, you know, things like pay and benefits are, are, are pretty much given expectations, but are we keeping them safe? Are we running our companies in a way that they feel that they are working for a stable employer? Are we being responsive to their needs in terms of the uh, what's coming out of the community? Uh, that whole work-life balance, which we've talked about already, is always going to come up. You know, are, are we requiring too much overtime? Are we asking too much of, of, of individuals? And so all of those things, I, I believe, are, um, are you know, are, are creating that inflection point. And then um, just having more expectation, uh, as we'll talk about in terms of how we are connecting with our environment and, and, and our community and, 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 and whether we're existing more than just to make money, I think are, are all very important um, points from the perspective of the employee. Rue, Wes, Peter? I'm not sure we're, we're at, a, at a single inflection point. Right. I, I see the, the journey right in terms of the expectations as more like a, a series of inflection points. I think if we are at an inflection point today, it's in a in a general sense that uh, whereas before we maybe thought, OK, it's gotten bad and it will get better and we'll, quote, return to normal. I think there's the inflection point we're at right now is people realize that you can't go home again and. The, the return to normal will be a new normal. I don't think anyone fully understands what the new normal will be. But when I talk to a number of our customers, there is, I think, a recognition with them and the workforces that they represent that there, there is the, the new normal is going to be different. And they know that will apply to things like greater capacity for remote work. They know that it will involve a lot more paperwork for a while to come right on managing COVID and, and things like that. So I don't think it's in the detail, Steve, but I think it, there is an inflection point in terms of the expectation and the acceptance of, yeah, this is the new reality. Yeah, I, I was going to, I said, I would say this is the new normal. I mean, people have been working from home for the last year plus, you know, probably going to have a tendency to stay home or a lot of those, at least a, a large majority of them, whether it's because, you know, uh, employers have given in and seen that work from home can work or the fact that uh, the employees are going to say, I like this work from home and I don't want to go back. And there's plenty of other people, especially in this market, who will hire me under whatever condition. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm in a position I get to set the terms now. So um, I don't, you know, the, and, you know, the people that, you know, I don't want to say, uh, have aged out or, or to, to made a decision to leave the workforce early, they're not gonna come back. Um, and, it, and it may be a while before we may have pushed up the starting age of the people entering the workforce. So I, I don't see it changing. I see uh, you know, the, a lot of people fortunately have embraced this and this is just set their course and this is, this is how we're gonna move forward. I think the sooner the rest of us realize that that's that's where things are going, the better. Rue, anything to add there? No, I totally agree with these points made. So I think, you know, I've been in cases where people have been working from home for a year and a half and like they ask, okay, we're going to open the office and we want you to come back in. And they're like, no, nope, not doing it. <laughs> I, have, I have options, right? And uh, if it was good for a company through an entire fiscal year, people will say, well, it's it's good for you for the next year. And uh, I found a little more balance in my life and flexibility, and, and uh, I'm okay being in my pajamas all day, and I'm still getting work done for you. Uh, so now it's my choice more than it is your choice as an employer. So I think people have to be cognizant of that. Obviously, as we talk about manufacturing jobs on the floor, it's a little bit of a different game, right? You need, we need people with skills and bodies to actually go operate equipment, but all the support stuff, uh, you know, I think in today's day, they have options. Yeah. 
And maybe, uh, and, you know, oh, go ahead, Wes. I, I was just going to say, agreeing with Rue, I, I, I touched on something else. So you got now you have two, you have, we've created a class, uh, you know, another situation that's, that's difficult for, for us to, to manage. We've got a group that has to work, come to work every day, and a group that can get to stay home. And certainly the, the group that has to go to work every day is going to be, uh, I don't want to say upset, but to have a, you know, what are you doing for me because you're making me come to work? And, you know, how do we, how are we going to deal with that? Or, you know, someone gets to work from home a couple of days a week. And why do I, why do I not get to work from home? Yeah. You know, those are questions <laughs> we have to answer much more frequently. Yeah. Certainly the pressure, you know, it seems like the pressure of what's going on in office environments and the flexibility and the, you know, hybridness that we're all accepting as part of just go go forward, the new normal, as Peter calls it, um, is is gonna have ramifications to the to the floor. You know what I mean? And uh, there might be a different version of of what that looks like, but certainly I think that part of the workforce is gonna expect some flexibility uh, that came up earlier um, and some other some other things in terms of what what it, what does it look like for them you know uh, which will which will be which will definitely be a, a grappling point as you mentioned Wes in terms of going forward all right uh, new question um, so the there's the whole notion of the circular economy and uh, you know we've touched on this a little bit you know Libby you've kind of uh, uh, touched on this a little bit in one of your previous answers but you know, what's the impact on on you know human resource management and and the whole notion of of the concept of a circular economy? So, um, as a manufacturer of plastics, um, obviously we have a a uh, an, an obligation and commitment to be a responsible manufacturer. Um, we want to engage with our customers, our employees, and the community to make sure we're helping to protect the environment and um, you know that that is just something that's 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 part part of what we do, part of what we want to be committed to, um, and and being responsible. Um, and so for 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 I think for HR one, we need to recognize that more and more employees who come to work in our our manufacturing facilities and in, in, in manufacturing in general, this is a concern for them because uh, they're looking at what this this. Uh, uh, whole carbon footprint look like for me in terms of you know uh, my future, the future of my kids. Um, are we conserving resources? All of that, and so again, uh, coming up with initiatives around our own manufacturing processes, making sure we are actively engaged in recycling, uh, whether it be pa paper, plastics, other items, all of those things, um, uh, and showing that we're committed. Uh, whether it's conserving water, whether it's uh, other environmental elements that. Again, Again, we, we want to make sure because uh, our clients demand that of us, our employees want to see that from us, our communities want to see that from us. And so it's very much um, front and center and, and, and should be part of uh, any planning that we're doing. And, 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 and again, making sure that our employees make a personal commitment as well, um, along with some of the um, maybe technical commitments we're looking at. And so it, it really involves every employee. It really involves every member of our communities uh, that we support. And so, um, and if I may just take a shameless plug, one of the things uh, we're asking everyone to do, and I'll, I'll challenge everyone here on this call, is if you get uh, all of those little flyers in the mail, maybe brochures, things that you don't really want to receive, go ahead and, 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 and contact those individuals, those companies and say, well, hey, I appreciate it, but, but don't send me any more paper. Um, because we're just, you know, we're just cut, just cutting down trees for no apparent reason. So let, let me make a, a shameless plug there. But but again, it's it's really about being responsible and and making sure that as leaders uh, in, in industry that we are holding ourselves uh, to a high standard around our commitment to limiting that carbon footprint um, and that we're we're engaged with everyone who wants to be a part of this effort. You know, Libby makes a great point. It's it's not only as an employer who you are, but how you show up in your community, right? So the, the representation of your brand as a good place to work is important. And, you know, being part of you know, charitable events, helping the community, looking like helping the community, I think is is a big deal, especially when you get to smaller smaller communities like the one I live in. Um, 
that that's important. People would be like, I've heard of you guys, and I've always wanted to work there, and they had never been in the building, but they've always wanted to work there because we built that brand over many, many years, which is nothing but help when it comes to tough times like now. Yeah, no, good point. It's not, uh, it kind of goes back to the point of, you know, this is an opportunity as much as anything, um, as much as a set of challenges and these kind of places that reaffirm who you are and your identity and your your purpose start shining through, right? That's the authentic side of of what organizations stand for. You know, that puts put it on the test. All right, let's move to our, oh, go ahead, Libby. Looks like you're gonna oh, add. Yes, <laughs> so I, I don't think I heard a commitment to my challenge from everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm committed, Libby. Libby, I have an absolutely zero objection to stopping all paper things coming to my my house, especially the catalogs. All, all right, and, and and make sure your family members do that, and 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 pass it on to your employees if if you haven't. Thank you. That's a good one. As we head into like the holiday season, this stuff just escalates, right? So Libby, you're right on. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. Those bills will show up too. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. That's there. Uh, all right, uh, moving to our kind of final question. Let's kind of, you know, we've we've dug, we've dug into a lot of kind of different aspects of different challenges, short term, longer term, COVID. Uh, now let's kind of just back back up and just kind of have some parting thoughts in terms of, you know, what what should you know manufacturing and leaders be thinking about right now in terms of you know kind of moving forward and. Uh, you know, from a leadership perspective, what what would be our recommendations of of those key things? And Rue uh, started things off and and did a great job kind of laying out the picture. Going to give you first uh, first crack at this as well. Well, let's put a bow around this thing. I think the common theme today has been leadership. So that's that was part of the word in your question, and, and it is leadership. And it's you know, Libby said this earlier. People used to leave bad bosses. I think they still leave bad bosses. They also leave bad jobs now. And I mean, I'm working with a couple of construction companies where crew members will leave for two bucks an hour. You know, so what are you doing around creating a great place to work so they're not looking somewhere else for two bucks an hour? So, you know, leaders should come with a clear vision, especially when times are cloudy right now. Uh, and it may not always be the right answer. It may be like, hey, this is the best I know. So here's what I got. And it, it may change and be very cognizant and honest about, you know, this this game may change in three weeks, but I'll be talking to you about it then. So a clear vision with good communication, you know, a genuine care for the people that you've got, looking like help. Let me call it out. The first thing we care about is our employees' safety and their well-being. And then we then we can give us license to look at the rest of the stuff. You know, addressing issues, uh, creating and fostering the culture, being active around that that culture, creating a good brand in your place, outside your place within your community that that it feels good to work for that company. I've heard good things. I've always wanted to be there kind of stuff. And then one thing that I'd add is like in today's time of stress, the, the extra care goes in. Yeah, we providing resources to deal with things like with mental health issues and helping our employees through those things. Because as much as we see that, well, our folks are definitely dealing with the same things. Uh, and we put them on longer schedules or more rigid work. They might be dealing with more of that uh, than less of that. So are we helping our folks and their families? Uh, so yeah, that costs money, but it's a family proposition, right? I mean, this, the employee takes that stuff back home or brings stuff from home back to work so we can help them uh, certainly creates a better environment. Now, are we aware of our surroundings? You know, what's the, what's the factory down the street or the, or the office down the street paying? Are benefits changing? Are time off policies being more flexible, quality of work? So that's all in that bucket called leadership. And, you know, and you laid that out and it's what we've been talking about for like the last hour or so it's it that that is the answer and it doesn't leadership doesn't have to be right all the time but leadership has to be right on in terms of being available being caring being you know the voice of reason being the shoulder to cry on and and the hand to pick people up with and uh, in that in times like today that's needed yeah just to add to what something you know Rue and Louie talked a lot about you know, it doesn't, I don't think it has to be expensive. Um, just engaging with team members and letting them know that, hey, I'm going through the same thing. Let's talk about it. Just everybody having a, saying, it's okay. Everybody's feeling uh, similar. Uh, it's, you know, acknowledging that it's, these are difficult times right now uh, and everybody's tired and, you know, probably rather be dealing with different set of circumstances so and being authentic in it so on that empathy um 
think also to uh, you know a lot of the stuff we talked about you know especially particularly with the flexibility and alternate sources of labor and it, it gets complex so we have to have a willingness to uh, search for you know more sophisticated tools or develop more sophisticated ways of managing labor and uh, scheduling labor you know and utilizing labor uh, and making as much as we can making the job uh, for our leadership especially those frontline supervisors easier uh, if, if we just say all right it's tougher it's hard it's more complicated you can take all these things into uh, into consideration now um, we're going to create a bigger problem than solve. We got to figure that up, figure that out upstream, and and take that off their plates so they can have those uh, that engagement with the employees that's so needed right now. I think building off off Wes's point, I think a, a big part of, of leadership, and I think an opportunity for leadership right now is to find the win wins for both the employer and the employee. Right. I mean, you know, shift flexibility, right, is a perfect example of this, but there's many examples of this where if you look carefully at the issue and the problem, right, around supply shortages and staffing shortages and the need for employees to have flexibility in their schedules, not all the time, but quite often the solution is actually something that potentially the employees would want and is good for the organization and is good for your production schedule resilience, right? If instead of going in with very fixed schedules, you go to a more flexible approach. So I think as leaders, we need to look for those opportunities in this market. Uh, and I think they exist. I think ironically in COVID, they may actually exist more than perhaps they did two years ago. Yeah, the drivers, a good point. Libby, I'm gonna give you the final word. So communication is key, uh, always uh, being concerned about the safety and well-being of our employees um, and having that, and we talked about the weather, having that hurricane plan already. Uh, if, you, if you're if you just trying out your strategy when the weather comes in, uh, you're, you're pretty much not going to be successful. So the, this, is, this is an ongoing, it's a process, it's an ongoing process and uh, definitely something uh, to be focused on when things are going well, to be ready for when things aren't going well. Yeah, <clears throat> well, well stated. Um, well, I want to thank our awesome uh, team of panelists here today for your generous time and uh, and just the, the conversation. I thought uh, it, w it was great and covered a lot of different areas. I want to thank the audience for spending your time watching this and, and, and listening in as well. And just a reminder, if you have submitted any questions, um, we will be getting back to you very shortly with answers. And then There'll be an email going out with the with the link to this recording. Um, if you want to reference it or pass it along, as well as LinkedIn, just contact information if you'd like to reach out to any of the panelists today. So thank you for joining. Thank you again, panelists, and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Steve.